Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning in our discussion of local place-based economic development, also known as placemaking. Uh, placemaking is a community and economic development strategy that attempts to capitalize on existing local assets and, and build upon them to create appealing spaces where people want to live, work, and play. Research here at the Ford School through the Michigan Public Policy Survey has lo uh, looked at placemaking efforts across the state of Michigan over the past few years and found that since 2009, um, there has been a significant increase uh, in its use by Michigan local governments and an increase in the confidence in its use as a strategy by local leaders in jurisdictions large and small across the state. Um, however, I'm sure that our outstanding guest speaker is going to uh, give you much more information about placemaking in Michigan and what's going on in our communities when it comes to the strategy. So let me just tell you uh, that our talk today is sponsored by the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, also known as Close Up, as well as co-sponsored by the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. The lecture is part of a series of talks uh, associated with the Close Up in the Classroom initiative. Through the current Ford School undergraduate course entitled Michigan Politics and Policy, Close Up in the Classroom is working to integrate student experiences with the center's research activities, um, such as those with Michigan local economic development techniques. We'd like to thank the provost's office for its support, both of the Michigan Politics and Policy class uh, and as well as this lecture series. Uh, the provost's office assistance not only lets us get U of M's state and local government research into the classroom, uh, but also allows us to bring esteemed guest speakers in today, <coughs> like our speaker, Dan Gilmartin. Dan is the executive director and CEO of the Michigan Municipal League. MML is a nonprofit association of municipalities and mis municipal leaders in the state of Michigan that was founded in 1899. Uh, and it represents the mutual interests of villages and cities of all sizes through advocacy at both the state and federal level. Dan is recognized nationally, uh, is an expert in the fields of urban revitalization, placemaking, local government reform, and transportation policy. He serves as a member of the Michigan Future Incorporated Leadership Council and on the Placemaking Leadership Council. He recently served on the board of directors of the National League of Cities, and he's also a blogger, author, and radio talk show host. Please welcome Dan Gilmartin. Thank you all. Good morning to everybody. I, uh, I don't know if it's the stirring conversation or the free pizza that brought you out, but I'm going to assume it was the former. If it's the latter, we don't, we don't even need to talk about it. But um, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate Close Up. Uh, one of the things the league has is a great relationship with Close Up and much of the work, uh, much of the work they do from a surveying perspective of local officials is very important to us because it gives us baseline data of what mayors and city managers and council members around the state are working on and what they feel like are their biggest issues out there and it drives a lot of what we do and I know it drives a lot of what you guys are doing from an academic perspective. So a very important partner uh, we have here in the University of Michigan. Uh, we also mentioned that we Started in 1898. Uh, we're actually, uh, what's that? So what did you say? 99? Yeah. The first meeting was 99. So uh, we're actually up on North Campus uh, and uh, up, at, up off of Green Road. So um, for 40 or 50 years, faculty from the University of Michigan actually uh, staffed the organization until the 1930s, I believe, when uh, they decided to go off and, and do their thing. So now there's no direct relationship between the two organizations, but it's a great working relationship we've had for a number of years. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a lot of things today, and I'm going to try to leave a lot of time for conversation and for questions, because uh, it's always fun to talk uh, to a group of uh, students, because I'm going to tell you what you all think. And I'm sure some of you are going to say, yeah, that's what I think, and some of you are going to say, this guy's nuts. So I welcome both of those conversations, uh, because uh, so much of what we're doing from a city building perspective uh, in, in, in Michigan and around the country, and probably, if we're being honest, throughout the world, is trying to figure out what's next, what people are looking for in communities, what people are looking for in housing, what people are looking for in experience, all those different things, which really leads us to placemaking and some of the things that we're doing. Um, it was mentioned about authorship. Uh, these are two books that the League has published. This is actually available out on the, out on, outside on a, uh, on a uh, table. Yeah, a table, that's a tough word. On the table. <laughs> Uh, right outside, there's only about 80 copies. In the back of the room is Matt Bach. Give us a queen wave, Matt. Uh, Matt's our media relations person. 
Uh, so if you're interested, if you're an insomniac and you need something like this to help you get to sleep at night, although finals are coming up, so you probably don't want to sleep, after finals if you need something, if you're not able to get one of the books out there, because I don't know that we have one for everybody, uh, give Matt your information on the way out the door. We'll make sure that we get something from you and um, maybe we set up a time to pick them up or whatever, whatever works, because there's messaging in there around, again, what, what everybody's doing and what we're trying to do as far as working together to uh, build better communities. So I'll tell you a little bit about how the organization that I work for, uh, which advocates and educates and educates and does research on all kinds of different things in terms of cities and, and what we can do to make our cities uh, more competitive, what we can do to make our cities better places to live. Uh, and so um, we went and we looked and we tried to figure out sort of where we were at. So our, our whole issue started about, or our whole campaign, if you will, started about seven or eight years ago. And uh, you know, this slide talking about the way we were and the way we are. Who knows what, sorry, you got a little thing. Who knows where that is? No? No? Packard plan. Free book for that man back there. Um, and a free slice of pizza, too. They're probably both gone, so we'll get you back. That's the old Packard plan in Detroit. So again, if you look at Michigan, the economy we're built on, let me step back. How many of you are from Michigan? How many not? Okay, so maybe half and half, a little more from Michigan. So I'll talk a lot about Michigan here because it's really been our focus. But our focus then works out around the, around the country and literally around the globe. So for the better part of 100 years, you could have an eighth grade education and walk into a place like this and do, do work paying you above the national average, uh, first to get health benefits, first to get retirement. Uh, you can live in a community. You could fish and hunt up north. You could live the American dream, if you will. Um, and this is what you could do. And this is how we built our cities. And this is when you look at our infrastructure and everything else we built around um, sort of who we, who we were as a state. And I would say that a lot of the quote unquote Rust Belt states were built in the same fashion, East Coast states as well. So that's how we were. How are we now? And you look at what's happening in Michigan now. We're 32nd in per capita income in 2015. Uh, since 2000, that's a drop in 16 spots. So if anybody here is, a, is studying economics uh, and is familiar with statistics and looking at those types of issues, you know, one or two or three spots in a, in a decade is a, is a solid trend. But to go from a relatively, uh, from the top third in the country in terms of per capita income to the bottom third in terms of per capita in, a, in, in well under two decades is pretty amazing. Uh, and that's the manufacturing industry in this state literally falling off a cliff uh, over the last 15 years. And as it reinvents itself, there's a lot of good things happening with the corporations, but one thing they're not doing is hiring people back, as we all know. So uh, again, you look at those people in the background uh, and they're not having those jobs come back. We're now 39th in GD GDP per capita. Um, we're 34 34th in Texas paid per capita, uh, 42nd in employment as a share of population, and Michigan's two biggest metropolitan areas, Detroit and Grand Rapids, rank 38th and 49th out of 52 metropolitan regions in the country uh, in terms of our per capita income. So those are all really bad numbers. And then you can trace that across unemployment, across per capita income, and all kinds of different things. We like to look at per capita income because it kind of wipes everything else aside. No, it doesn't adjust all the time for cost of living, but you know, unemployment is unemployment. Uh, Alabama and Minnesota have relatively the same unemployment, but the Minnesota uh, quality of life is a lot better. Uh, and we're looking at about 12,000 difference in per capita income. So uh, we, we try to hang our hats on that one a little bit, but we can look a number of different ways. So uh, basically we had a manufacturing industry here in this state, and all of a sudden people want something completely, not all of a sudden, but people want something completely different from their communities in terms of how we were building them. Um, so again, I, as I said, manufacturing as we know it is gone. Manufacturing is still vitally important to Michigan, but it's a different kind of manufacturing. In most uh, factory jobs, now you can't get hired without a college degree. Uh, they're very technical jobs. If there were two or 3,000 people working at a Ford plant in 1960, um, chances are that Ford plant's gone, but the Ford plant's still there. There's probably now 400 people working there most of them working from a technological standpoint. So the sort of brawn labor that we were famous for in Michigan is, is not there. And even as the, 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 the car companies are coming back and posting record profits, they're still not hiring people back. So that way of life, if you will, is completely different. It gets back to how we build our communities and what people want. 
Um, so as you talk about the recovery rate there as well, we're recovering and we brag about, oh, we're creating jobs in the state, but we're st you know, we hemorrhaged so many, we're creating back at a, very, at a very low average. So we've got to figure that one out. That's the Packard plant, not pla bleh, that's the Packard plant now. Whoops, sorry, my fault. I did that to you. So a little bit different in terms of the picture you just had a little while ago, which was sort of held up there as, uh, as Great Americana. Uh, who knows where that community is? Anyone 20 miles from here? Northville? No? Just happens to be where I live. I don't know how it got a slide got on there. But, um, so what do we know? So we get back. So my organization, seven, eight, nine years ago, cities are dead in Michigan. Uh, the picture of that Packard plant had become who we are in this state. And, and I would argue the state's sort of a canary in the coal mine, not a one-off, as people like to play, as people like to, to look at Michigan and some of the other cities that are suffering. Um, so we look around the country, we look around the world. Why are we getting beat by Portland, by Austin, by Boston, by Seattle, by Chicago, Minneapolis here in the Midwest? Why are those cities, regions, states doing much better than us? Massachusetts, uh, by any measure out there, uh, they're, doing, they're doing well. How many of you have, have a, a friend who's recently graduated and moved to one of those places? You know, lots of you. And, um, if you're, when you graduate, if you stay in Michigan and your friends, as my colleague Allison up here, who's recently hired into our organization knows, they say, what are you still doing in Michigan? You should be in one of these places. That's where it's happening. So when we try to figure that stuff out, we try to say, why are they losing? Because in Michigan, like other places, and we just got through a presidential campaign with so we talked about, when we talk about economic development, we talk about taxes, then we talk about government regulations, and the conversation stops. And we don't lose in Michigan on that stuff anymore. Our taxes used to be relatively high, now they're relatively low. And all the places I just mentioned, many of them have much higher taxes, have lousy regulations. I mean, how many of you have friends that are working in Chicago? Uh, a lot of MBAs tending bar in Chicago, rather than taking a job with a, with a CPA firm in Detroit or in Grand Rapids, because they want to be in Chicago. Um, and then for people that are going there, how many of your friends come out and say, hey, I'm gonna move to Chicago, and the reason I'm going is because the taxes are low and the regulatory environment's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, the next person who says that is going to be the first person who ever said that. So all we're ever hearing from state government and from the feds and in the media is, we've got to work on taxes, we've got to work on regulations. Lower than Minneapolis, lower than Massachusetts, lower than Boston, you know, some, if you look at it regionally or citywide. So that wasn't working. So we started to look, what is working? Why are these places beating us? And we started to see some themes develop uh, that was very early on into this sort of conversation, this movement. There are people like Peter Allen in the back of the room engaged in it and, and others, Jermaine, who was with Mr. Where's Jermaine over here? Uh, over there. Uh, we're sort of getting our arms around this, trying to figure out what it all meant. Uh, we know that when it comes to building great communities, uh, improving people's quality of life, in, uh, improving the experience of the place, we know that knowledge-based jobs matter and a knowledge-based economy matters. Uh, the good jobs now are where people think not necessarily where they do. Um, education counts, degrees matter. Now you can say, we have a tendency to talk about talent. You mentioned uh, uh, the Michigan, Michigan Future, which talks all about talent. Lou Glazer, if any of you ever walked into him. And talent's defined as four-year degrees and higher. Now we all know that just because you have a four degree doesn't mean you're talented. And if you don't have one, doesn't mean that you aren't. But it is literally one of those few statistics out there where it is a one-to-one -one nexus between having a relatively uh, educated population and high per capita income. The two go together right now more than anything. And I think for those of us that have been working on this a while, you know, when I first got into sort of looking at how to improve uh, job fronts, how to, how to improve economies, how to improve cities, the thought was always it's either business or quality of life. Because again, it was a Packard plan. Let's let them pollute, let's let them take up whole blocks, let's create big wide roads and things that don't make sense for sort of the human experience, but that's what drives our economy. So it was always sort of a zero sum game. And we found now is really it's the same game. Quality of life is where people are going. It's certainly where people uh, with means and where people with entrepreneurial <laughs> spirit, and where people with uh, access to, to all sorts of different things are going. So it's one and the same now about creating that great place in terms of creating a great economy. Technology allows people to work anywhere, yet they're choosing cities. This is something the futurists got wrong. Um, so 23 years ago now is Netscape Browser, 1993, is that right? 
the whole, all cities were going to empty out. Everyone's going to live on a mountaintop and, you know, email their stuff and probably fax it in then or whatever it was. <laughs> um, didn't happen, right? We're now more urbanized as a people than we've ever been. People are going to cities and metropolitan areas. They're not going to rural places. And I think what we found out is two things. Number one is we forgot that human beings are social animals. And when given a choice, they want to be around other human beings. And number two, from an entrepreneurial spirit, there's something about the churning that happens in an economy that can't happen if you're sitting alone on a mountaintop. Now, I'm sure someone discovered a Fortune 500 business sitting alone on a mountaintop, so that, that happens. But in the, in, the, in the totality of it all, having places like Ann Arbor, quite frankly, where you get a lot of churning going around and a lot of uh, smart, engaged, entrepreneurial, thoughtful people working on particular issues, that's where you get uh, real changes that move, move people forward. So, Something we got wrong, because I think if we were sitting here 20 years ago saying, what's the future, it'd be like, wow, you know, we got to close down these cities and do whatever it is we're doing somewhere else. Population's more mobile than it's ever been. Uh, and uh, again, something that is, is very different. Uh, it used to be jobs would follow, uh, or people would follow jobs. And again, if you, maybe some of your parents or grandparents worked at Ford Motor Company in 1965, and they said, you're getting transferred to, to Knoxville, Tennessee, you went home and threw for sale sign up and grabbed the spouse and the family and you're gone. And nowadays it's uh, how many of you are going to look for a place you want to live before you look for a job? You know, most of you, if we know that. So, um, and, and we now have numbers and figures and statistics that prove that out. Uh, so uh, we've got this hugely mobile population. No one expects to work somewhere for 40 years anymore and retire. Um, so that comes into play in terms of what we're doing to, to attract. Okay, so we're not doing a midterm exam, but if we were, just write down place attracts people and repeat that like nine times when asked by your professor, and you will pass this course because that's what really matters. Uh, it's about the place. That's what this is all about. People are going to places. People want to be able to experience things in a place that they live, where they work, where they play, where they learn. And if we're not providing that stuff at a high enough number, we're going to continue to hemorrhage people out of the state. Uh, and cities like us around the country will do the same thing. Um, you know, I just said earlier, uh, young people, two-thirds of them, two-thirds of college-educated people under the age of 35, choose where they want to live first, then look for work. So I want to be in Chicago, and I'll figure it out when I get there. I want to be in Portland, I'll figure it out when I get there. Maybe somebody went with an offer, uh, but more often than not, they don't. They know they want to be somewhere. And, uh, that, again, is fundamentally different than where we were before. And by the way, all the companies know where everyone's going. They know who lives on the street more than the mayor does uh, in terms of who's there, what skills they have, what degrees they have, whether or not it's a place to sit your, your company. And I always tell a story about, I tell two, two stories about this. Number one was VW, Volkswagen of North America, used to have its headquarters in Auburn Hills. Anybody from Auburn Hills? Anybody from somewhere they can drive to Auburn Hills on a relatively short commute? Okay. Um, the, it was then Governor Granholm, so it's been a few years, but uh, it was a big thing. VW said they were going to go to the coast, and they wanted to go to the coast because they felt like they needed to attract a different type of employee. Um, they felt like their, um, their, uh, uh, their market, if you will, was more coastal in terms of people looking for a better driving experience. And, some of the things they want to do as a corporation, uh, and they decided they were going to go off to the coast. And I remember Governor Graham came in and offered every possible tax advantage they could offer, and they said, no, that's where we're going. And they left behind, I think, 100 or 200 call center jobs. That's a nice little see ya to Michigan, which may or may not still even be here. Uh, so that's something of people deciding where they want to go. The other one was I was contacted by a software engineer who was um, or a software company who was doing gaming, computer gaming. Again, one of the more, uh, I would imagine, I'm not in that field, but I would imagine it's one of the more technically um, competitive fields out there in terms of, you know, games change every day, it seems like, and there are new things coming out. And this individual has gone from 50 employees, was on their way to 200. They were expanding rapidly, and they were considering, considering Seattle or Detroit at the time. Uh, Seattle's college-educated adult population is 53%. Detroit's at that time was 11. They can't choose Detroit, you know, because they're going to look to get the best people in to, to literally compete with, you know, people and businesses and countries that none of us could even find on a map 
and um, they couldn't choose a trite in that situation. So again, taxes, incentives, that stuff doesn't even matter at that point in time. Might matter if you're putting a big, big uh, manufacturing spot in the field, but ain't there. So and again, we're in the sort of whole global initiative and global, global hunt for all this stuff. Um, a lot of times people will challenge us and say, oh, this, this placemaking stuff is all feel good. Uh, but here's the publisher of Forbes uh, magazine a few years ago. It said the most valuable resource in the 21st century is brains. Smart people tend to be mobile. Watch where they go because where they go, robust economic activity will follow. And we see this time and time and time again uh, where people decide where they want to be. And again, when I, when I asked earlier where you guys, what you guys are thinking, you've probably got ideas about where you want to go when you're done with your educational experience. And you'll figure out the job stuff later. Uh, and uh, that's something we continually see. So we've got to do a better job here in the state of working on that because we're losing big time on that stuff. Um, so I'm talking to students here, but there are not, not everyone in this room is a student. So here's a little, here's a little bone for everybody else. Um, the dirty little secret about creating great places is, is that their baby, boomy, baby, boomy, baby boomer mothers and fathers want the same kinds of places to live in as their millennial, ch millennial children do. Uh, which is interesting. So when you talk about this, this is from ARP, 90% of the 45 plus population indicated they want to stay in a community for as long as possible. And it's important for, them, important for them to remain near their family and friends and to be able to access the services they need. And when you start talking to the retiring boomers, and I'll get to, in a second to what we really believe from a placemaking standpoint makes a city attractive, it makes a city competitive, you'll find the same types of things is what, is what uh, older empty nesters are looking for in terms of, of what they want out of, their, out of their lives and what out of the places they live as their millennial children, which is really interesting. So you're talking about walkability and culture activities and a whole bunch of other things, transit. Um, now their Saturday nights probably look a little different, <laughs> right? But the concept that there's a lot of options and a lot of ideas are things that they're looking for. And although we just have anecdotal information at this point in time, we probably we probably, it's probably more than anecdotal at this point. I just don't have that information. But what we were seeing the last few years is, it used to be, everyone would say, oh yeah, kids move away, you know, and they go have their fun in Chicago, and then they, have, then they get married and have kids, and they move back here to be with grandma and grandpa. And that apparently happened for a long time. Um, you know what, grandma and grandpa are moving to them now. It's like, you wanna come back to Sterling Heights, or should we go get a condo in, in Wrigleyville and enjoy ourselves and have fun? And we're seeing that happen now. So, Again, I don't have start hard statistics on that, but we see it. Um, who reads uh, um, Fast Company magazine? Who's familiar with it? Okay, a little bit. Used to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Magazines are like nightclubs. They go like, whoa, and then it's like, that's not cool anymore. <laughs> um, so Fast Company is sort of the Forbes of the new generation of businesses. I would describe it, and anyone can say if I'm wrong, it's sort of, half lifestyle, half entrepreneurism. They're trying to find the next Google. They're trying to find the next Microsoft. You know, we like to see they're, they're, they're out there uh, uh, doing exposés on guys sitting in his mother's basement in his underwear blogging who's gonna be a billionaire next year. Perhaps you know this gentleman. I'm sure we all do. Um, so they, all, they, do, they try to find those fast companies again. One of the things they do every year is they pick fast cities, best places to do business around the world. Uh, so they do big cities and small cities. They've done Chicago one one year, London one one year, um, other places. And then uh, a couple of years ago, they did something where Sid, the smallest city was 2,500 people. I think the largest one was San Francisco. So we're literally going from little tiny places like Norfolk, which I just showed, up into uh, the big metropolitan regions. And they picked uh, nine, I believe. Yes, right? Nine different places. Now, I don't have the communities up here, but this is what, why they chose them. It's a business magazine, right? Where are we going to do business? How are we going to improve our economy? What are we as a business, uh, as a business publication putting out there as being a top place to do business? These are the reasons they chose them. Farm fresh food, venture capital mindset, renaissance neighborhoods, car sharing, smart energy, all this kind of stuff. Now, is that taxes? Is that regulations? No. It's none of that stuff. So when you hear taxes and regulations going along with good places to do business, that's not where it's at anymore. And it's, it's not like go raise taxes, everything will be better. That's not my message. But the fact that we, f we, we focus almost from a hyper standpoint, Leslie, especially in the political environment on that stuff, these are the things that matter. This is why you want to live somewhere. Stuff like this. Maybe not everything up here is your bag, but this is where they see cool, cool stuff is happening. Culture, um, open source government. These are where people want to live. So 
again, we, and through all our studies and, and, and the book we have here, I mean, it's out front for people. Again, you can check it out. This is the second book, which is more of a, um, of a look. This Actually, Zingerman's is in here and some other Ann Arbor programs that you can check out. Um, but it's, this is more of sort of a, a case study of a number of different places that have been doing good stuff. The first book was more explaining sort of what I'm, what I'm talking about here, which we learned from people all over the world. So we've created something we call our eight assets. Uh, when we go and try to figure out what actually makes a community move forward, the, the nexus between strong economies, between communities looking to the future, between communities being more competitive for people, for jobs, came down, we thought, broke down into these eight particular areas. So it's the physical design and the walkability of the place. You know, think about the human scale. When people ask me, what is placemaking? I say placemaking is improving the, the human experience. You know, everybody else probably has, I know everybody, a lot of people have different definitions of it. Some are really long. Peter, you teach a course. Do you have a definition? One you want to share? No. It's good. It's good. All right, so. Um, so much for audience participation, huh? <laughs> no, I do that. But I mean, everybody's doing that kind of stuff and saying, you know, it's this, it's that, it's the context and the, it's a lot of different things, but it's about knowing, you know, it's sort of like you know it when you see it. You know, for those of you from Michigan, when I talk to groups in Michigan, I say, if we're going to decide on the five best communities in Michigan right now, think about it, we'd have consensus in five minutes, ten minutes. They'd have this stuff. Have some history, have some architecture, have some cool downtown feel, have kind of a neat vibe to it, some neat businesses, some, um, some forward thinking, probably some, uh, some waterfront maybe somewhere. I mean, all those types of things, that's what we describe. But 95% of Michigan doesn't look like that. It's, it's five and six and seven lane roads, and nothing's walkable. And it's built for sort of a different type of a place. So um, we've, we've done city building since 1950 for a different culture centered around automobile. And all of a sudden people are saying, wait a second, no, if I have a choice in this matter, I'd rather enjoy my everyday life. And that's what type of place I want to live in. So physical design and walkability matters an immense amount. Uh, green initiatives, you know, completely 20 years ago, being green was sort of, uh, okay, fine, you can do that. And people look at you cross-eyed. Uh, it's a value. It's a value that an entire generation has grown up with. So again, when I talk about, when people say it's all about uh, re environmental regulations and those types of things that hurt us from an economic standpoint, I'd say, ask a young entrepreneur if she'd rather be, uh, put her business in a community with a relaxed environmental policy or with a long-term commit commitment to sustainability. She'll choose the latter, you know, 99 times out of 100, uh, unless she's in the landfill business or something like that. And that, I can tell you that goes completely against some of the things we talk about at City Hall we talk about uh, at the state government level, and we talk about in Washington. Cultural economic development. What, what distinguishes you a little bit differently from where you're at? I mentioned uh, uh, Northville. It's an old uh, Victorian town with some sort of a neat Victorian story to it. Ann Arbor is a college town. It's got a whole bunch of things going on here. Those are the things that you want to you wanna dig into. The Detroit experience is a really interesting one. 10 or 15 years ago, 90% of the articles about Detroit were negative. Now 90% of them are positive. Um, it's, it's still the same city. It's changing rapidly, as we all know. But um, sort of that grittiness of a community and the history of it there. And it, yes, it needs polishing and scrubbing and rebuilding and everything else. But the bones of the place are so cool, people can't keep themselves away from it. Um, yet our entire policy of how we create communities, where we fund infrastructure, uh, what our local uh, uh, guidelines and zoning regulations look like, all look like Canton Township which is you know, 2,500 square feet or 3,000 square feet on a quarter acre lot in an undrivable place. If you're a builder, you can build that pretty much anywhere in the state, uh, but you can't rebuild Southview anywhere or Woodward Avenue or anything like that. What does that mean? That doesn't make any sense, right? So when people say we need more of this or more of that, I, I, we're playing different sports here. You know, it's like we're shooting free throws, we need to be scoring touchdowns. It's, not a diff it's just a whole different animal in terms of aiming at places that people want to be in. Uh, and, and that's something that I, I think we all want to see. Entrepreneurship. You know, again, think back to the picture of Packard. Packard will come in. They, I don't know how many people they employed at their, at their height. Probably 20,000 people. Uh, the automobile industry itself, hundreds of thousands of people. Didn't need any particular training or anything like that. It's the ultimate irony, I say, in Michigan that Henry Ford, who for all of his obvious faults, uh, in my opinion, goes down as the, 
the top entrepreneur of the 20th century. He really literally recreated an entire world around, around a, uh, uh, an industrial economy. And the fact that he created a culture that's so non-entrepreneurial is sort of the irony of this whole thing. Because it used to be, you know, work there for 40 years, have the same job, retire, live for five years, move to Florida, wear high socks and a white belt, and then die. And that's what everybody did, right? And, you know, who expects to do that? Anyone? Come on, somebody does. Somebody has some guys. Has some guys. And that's just not where we're at. So now it's all about hyper-entrepreneurship, and it's about people doing different things. Nobody expects to be in the same place for 40 or 50 years, let alone five or 10 years. Um, so it becomes a whole different game in terms of how we're working on that. So if you're in a community that rolls up its sidewalks at 5 o'clock at night, who, want, who here wants to work there? You know, coffee shop closes at night because nobody drinks coffee at night. And, uh, the park closes and everyone goes home and nothing happens. Storefronts close. You know, you know I, I can give you a free building. I can, I, can, I can abate your taxes. You aren't going there. Not happening. So we got to figure that stuff out as well. Messaging technology, it's kind of obvious. Being welcoming. This is something we do a particularly poor job of in Michigan. And probably, if we're being honest, a particularly poor job across the country has been, has been illustrated in, in a number of different ways. Um, but as I like to say it, especially when it comes to uh, a different generation of people, and I'm talking all about you, most of you people here in this room, because we all know how you think more than you do, so feel free to, to push me on that, but we're all studying that. But I used to say people used to walk down the street and see individuals who look just like them, and now they kind of want to walk down the street and see individuals who don't. And does your community play to that at all? You know, and it's not about a Kwanzaa day or something. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. It's about are we welcoming to new ideas? Are we welcoming to all kinds of different uh, ideas or are we not? And I can tell you, especially in this state, we're not in a lot of places. It's obvious in our bigger cities, we have strife in a whole bunch of different levels and we can get into that if you guys want to. But even in our small towns, um, people don't want to change. And, and, and as we say, it's okay, you don't have to implement this kind of stuff. But if you don't and you want to complain that you're sort of not keeping up from an economic standpoint, you, you know, you can't do both. You, you can do both, but it doesn't work that way. You've got to sort of figure this stuff out. Transit. Who'd rather not own a car for the next five or ten years? You know, a lot of people. Um, you know, 500 bucks is a month for car insurance and a payment and gas and parking or more is wasted money to most uh, young people. They'd rather get a transit pass and use that money on technology uh, or booze, uh, whatever comes first. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so if you can't live that way in Michigan, then we're not staying here. And it was, it was brought up to me by um, a few years back in, at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, wonderful hospital. And uh, they used to bring in uh, residents People come in from all over the country from, for uh, medical residents to come to Henry Ford, and they compete for the best you know, residents the way other people do. And so somebody coming in is probably interviewing in Chicago and Los Angeles and everywhere else, and he said they'd land at the airport in Detroit, wonderful international airport in Romulus, and there's no train, there's no bus, no taxi service. Um, there's one taxi service. It's a single, uh, single group that's allowed on premises. That's another story. Um, and you got to take an eight-lane highway to get downtown, and then there's no way to get around down there in a lot of respects. I mean, it doesn't matter what Henry Ford does at that point. That person doesn't come, you know? Doesn't want to come. I travel a ton of my job, and when I land anywhere, I don't, I, people say, how you get in the hotels? I have no idea. There's going to be a shuttle. There's going to be an Uber. There's going to be some way for me to get to where I need to go, and it's probably going to be really easy for me to get to certain places like downtown, the convention center, the business district, um, suburban shopping even. Uh, we, we, a few years ago, a, f a gentleman who worked for us tried to get from downtown Detroit to, um, oh boy, Big Beaver, Troy, what's, Somerset Mall. So big, if you're not from Michigan, it's a big high-end mall. Uh, it took him three and a half hours on public transportation, and he had to walk the last mile and a half. That's how long it took him to get from downtown Detroit to Big Beaver to do shopping. Now, if I go anywhere else in the country and say, I'm a high-end shopper, I want to get to your high-end mall, you know, I'll have a private plane come for me. It's ridiculous. So <laughs> how, you know, you know, and again, so if it, we, can, we can tell the people in Troy, the people in Detroit, that's a problem. It's like with VW. The people in Auburn Hills actually lost the business. But if you're anywhere within a driving distance of Auburn Hills, they don't want to be in your community either. 
So that's where you get into sort of the regional strategy of this whole thing as well. We've got to figure out better ways of doing this. Education is important, and obviously it's K-12, it's higher ed. Those things are all very important. But it's a commitment to education. And, and again, think about the economy that we're in now uh, and the ways in which we're committed to an educated workforce. And the thing I always bring up at a number of the Ivy League schools, if not all the Ivy League schools at this point in time, if you're 55 and older, you can audit classes for free. There's a ton of trailing spouses. There are professors and faculty and second careers, all kinds of different things happening there. You can literally go to one of the top schools in the entire country uh, for free if you live in that county or that city and depends on, on the different areas of the, uh, the different schools that offer it. What does that say? Who wants to live there? You know, who would choose that from a, from a value standpoint? I want to be there to do that. Would you rather the person looking for that? or somebody saying, I'm going to go where the taxes are the lowest. Um, taxes are the lowest in Mississippi or Alabama, by the way. Go there. No choice, no chance in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the new economy. Lovely places. I have relatives in Alabama. I'm not cutting them down, but they can't compete for these jobs. They're going to get a whole bunch of the, the, the sort of mid-range manufacturing jobs and different things that are, uh, that are out there, and they're going to be pay competing with places that offer even a, a lower scale, if you will. And when Michigan sort of, we taught racing to the bottom, when we push from our state policies to try to compete with that, why are we doing that? You know, why are we, it's back to per capita income versus unemployment. If everybody's employed in an industry making $9 an hour without benefits, have we done anything? Just because we dropped the points, the, the, uh, the number, two or three points, we really haven't done that. So education isn't just obvious K-12, I read those, that stuff's all very important. But how we celebrate that and what it means in terms of the value of a community matter a great deal. Um, Chris Leinberger, who used to teach here, uh, hasn't for a long number of years, right, Peter? So no, nobody here probably would have stumbled across uh, Chris Leinberger. But in addition to teaching, he's also a, a, uh, uh, the president of LOCUS, which I should know what that stands for, and I don't. But uh, it is a group of developers, private developers, who work to do infill-style infill housing, walkable housing, downtown entrepreneurial stuff. And this, this quote from Chris I thought was great. Expecting early 19th century, even mid 20th century governance structures to handle the challenges of the early 21st century is not realistic. And I will submit to you that this is legal in about 99% of the land mass in Michigan. 99.9, .9, I, I would guess. That is, that beautiful, gorgeous place <laughs> is legal. And State Street isn't in 99.9% .9 of it. Zero walk up, uh, no parking, old. That's illegal everywhere. Where, where, where do you wanna be? You wanna be in that? That's what all of our structures look like, you know? If you're gonna go try to build a building, you can build that. That's wonderful. Got a little car gutter in front of it. Got wonderful, uh, horrible <laughs> aluminum, you know? Uh, it's, it's really kind of striking. And, and again, what what, what does it say? You know, was it Churchill who said the buildings tell you, about tell you about a people? Architecture tells you about a people. What does it tell you about us? We're low bid and we're not terribly, what? Someone come up with a word. There's a free book in it, no? What, I heard one? Artistic. Artistic, so. Um, and notice the one the wonderful edifice in the background. That's sort of like the, the, the Eiffel Tower of this place. <laughs> Um, we deserve better than this. Come on, people. We deserve better than this. Who wants to live there? Anybody know what that is, by the way? That? We're not going to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> this is a little bit better. Uh, but when I talk about governing structures there, I think the governance structure at the local level, at the state level, has to change to make sure we don't have those places. We have more places like this. Um, so again, uh, trying to create communities that can attract and retain talent and enterprise, and again, where people want to live is something that matters a great deal. Um, you know, so uh, again, and, 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 I, and I wanted to save a lot of time to talk uh, about specifics when it comes to placemaking and how we can create these places. But when we think about how this has to happen in Michigan and how this has to happen in communities in Michigan and really anywhere, we talk about bold leadership. We talk about, I, I kind of feel like we're in our big short moment in the state. And then we see the film, The Big Short, or read the book. You're familiar with the story. These guys sort of figured out that, in, I think it was the second quarter of 2007, <laughs> that the, with the mortgage-backed securities, we're all going to go upside down. So they bought 
low and they shorted everything and, and then it came and they went, what happened? Nothing changed. The stock market didn't move. Uh, their numbers didn't go up and it was like this, this huge event happened and nothing went into it. And they started digging in and that's where they found out the regulators were in bed with the bankers and the bankers were in bed with the, the builders and, you know, all that stuff. And, and, you know, the story, and they created a wonderful story out of it and um, a great movie out of it in a book. But I kind of feel like we're in our big short moment here because we build this kind of a community and we govern for it. And for years, we've been talking about a different kind of community, right? We've been talking about a community maybe a little bit more like that. Uh, as a greater place to live. Now we know empirically that this place is a much better place from an economic standpoint in terms of creating jobs, in terms of living, where people want to be. We know that, but we're still doing all this. So it's sort of our big shorts. Like, well, if we just did that, we'd be there. And, uh, and that's where I think it's, we, we've got to change the entire mindset. So when I talk about needing bold leadership here, I think we need bold leadership at all levels of governance. I think we need it in citizenry. I think we need it in business. Uh, we don't see that. We understand where it's a global understanding of what we are. Uh, again, if you look at, um, you know, Canton Township 20 miles east of here next to Westland 25 miles east of here, for the last 50 years they've been staring down at each other as, at, at each other, at each other, uh, as competition in the economic development field for a, for a Ford plant, for a, for a dollar store like we just saw or whatever it might be. They're not in competition with one another. Greater Detroit's in competition with global, with places all over the globe. You know, can, can, can we come there? Can we attract talent? Can our people live in the kind of places they want to live? Can they, can they flourish? Will they stay there? Uh, those are the things that businesses are asking. So uh, the blue collar town and the affluent suburb and the, and the gritty downtown and the cool hipster markets and the college town, everything else, we're all in it together using our assets of today to try to figure out how we can go forward. And, from a big short perspective, we're still talking about 1980 and building plants and trying to steal a, a, a GM plant from Tennessee. Uh, Knowledge-based economy, higher education investment. We do a horrible job of investing in higher education in this state. Um, and, and, and I'm not one just to say invest, 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 but uh, you know, I thought about this uh, a number of years ago. You're, you're at a place that is the, um, the economic driver, the largest single economic driver in the entire state by a mile, and it's not even close. When you throw in the University of Michigan, it's hospital and all the entrepreneurial activity that kicks out from it. it ain't even close. Um, and, and I can tell you, and I don't know if there's any faculty here that's ever been to Lansing to beg for money, it's not fun. Um, and uh, it, it's an issue. We have 15 public universities and 40 some private ones, and they're all similar to what happens here on, on, on different scales, the MSU being similar and places like Alma College being very important to Alma, but not you know, too far outside of it. Um, and we just sort of turn and, and push and move away from that kind of thing. So it doesn't make a great deal of sense. If the University of Michigan were General Motors and they threatened to sort of pick up and go become, you know, the University of Tennessee or Tennessee Southern or somewhere uh, and, and ask for a tax abatement, I can't even imagine how big of an abatement they would, they would qualify for and need and get if that were the case. But instead, they're a public university so, uh, so we continue to push and, and punch on that stuff. And everything I've just talked to you about in terms, of, uh, in terms of education and jobs and everything makes a great deal of place. Quality of place matters. And again, from regional focus, if any of you are, are looking at government uh, as, a potential, um, as a potential career, I've been looking at local government here in Michigan, I've seen Detroit's bankruptcy and some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, everything gets talked about in terms of regionalism. And to me, that's sort of a cop-out because there's not a lot of... Uh, not a lot of uh, uh, regional savings from combining a police department or something like that. There's some there, but it's not the end of the world, believe me. Uh, but what we need more is a regional focus and a regional strategy of how we're going to move forward. That's what I talked about a few minutes ago in terms of getting everybody to think in terms of how do we take an asset of U of M, of a great international airport, of a cool, chic downtown like Detroit that's getting different types of people to come into it that want to be part of uh, sort of regrowing it. Um, and how we all sort of work together on those types of things is what we need to do regionally. And, and I would offer uh, uh, the research triangle in, in North Carolina and what they did in Boston around the universities there about 20 years ago, quite frankly, as ways to look at that kind of stuff and how they can leverage one another to create something uh, somewhat unique and really special. So there's a nice, uh, a nice Ann Arbor picture. Um, again, including people is there. Uh, we talked about that and we've talked about uh, our infrastructure and how we get 
sort of everybody to think about things. This is a little bit about art. And it's a little bit about uh, 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 engagement. Those types of things, again, I would argue are very important to an economy, not just superfluous or feel good stuff on the outside, which they've always sort of been looked at. So that ends my prepared remarks. Uh, I hope I left some time, yes, for, for questions or, or uh, challenges, because I, I would appreciate both if you've got them. Uh, and uh, with that, I will say thank you and ask if we have questions. Everybody still awake? Yeah, yeah still there? A few?